Hello, this is Greg Allison from Green Greg's Garden Worm Farm coming to you on the 24th of October 2020. Just a week from Halloween Day from a cotton field to report to you about soybeans shortages. Well, the shortages this time are driven by, seems, demand. And here's the crazy news. The crazy news is that the world's largest exporter of soybeans, Brazil, is now looking to import soybeans. Greg, how did that happen? Holy smoke, we're going to get all into that. And a bit more, we're going to talk about pandemic food shortages. <laughs> but before we do that, I'm going to say, hey, right now i got a special deal going on. You need to really have a hard look at it because I don't know how long these prices will be good. But uh, you, it will be $100 off a four-week supply of long-term storage food. It lasts for 25 years. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 2,000 calories a day will make you a winner. It also has desserts and drinks, so it's, a, it's not MREs. This is regular food that's been freeze-dried, dehydrated. So it's very portable and easy to carry buckets. All right, chat with prepwithgreg.com. Again, prepwithgreg.com. And uh, you can also get other prepping supplies if you click on the logo. And right now it's a really good time to prep with all the things going on in the world. Trust me, my friends, we don't know what's coming at us. But I'm here to help you keep your eyes wide open and head on a swivel. That's what I ask you to do because the proposition of my channel is to help you survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. Now that said, hey, I've seen many years where they planted soybeans right here. I haven't hardly, I've just seen very small soybean fields this year, not too many. Uh, usually they would alternate soybeans and, and uh, soybeans and corn. Well, the soybeans they would usually plant after winter wheat. And yeah, winter wheat is harvested in the spring late spring sometimes uh, and soybeans has got a short growing season and they wouldn't have to plow the ground so they could get two crops in a year when they do uh, wheat and beans but guess what I guess the beans wasn't that profitable because they're just not planted much around here this year and cotton is taken king and that's in part because well they got rid of the bug finally the uh, bow weevil has been eliminated finally at the scourge of cotton for generations since the 18 late 1800s when after cotton made it to Texas and they picked up the boll weevil from Mexico and it, it tracked back east and it decimated cotton crops for a long time so cotton uh, kind of was going away but now it's on a huge resurgence but that this is not food it's good for fiber it's good for the farmers but um, it, it's going to be an interesting story the production of food but fiber is also important now this cotton I'm going to go into the soybeans but this cotton is normally a lot fluffier but it's been raining Let's take a close look at it. This is wet. This stuff is so soaking. Now on a bright sunny day, it'd be fluffier and this field would be whiter and with the sun reflecting, it would be quite a sight to see this field shining so white. <laughs> uh, they've already harvested a lot of the cotton here. We've had good harvest and good years here for our crops. And that's usually true across the United States this year. Even though we did have late season uh, planting because it was wet, we ha are having a wetter than normal year. Oh yeah, by the way, this is our dry season. Yeah. October is one of the months of least rain, one of the two months of least rain of the year. And this is when I usually try to get a lot of the outside dry projects done. Like I got a hole in the ground I need to work in and it was only dry for about a week or two in there. Or a little bit earlier on I wasn't able to get to it when I wanted to. So I got to come up with an alternative strategy for dealing with that. All that said, let's go back to soybeans. Why is China, why is, excuse me, uh, Brazil suddenly wanting to import soybeans? Brazil has been the world's net exporter of soybeans, exporting 54% of all the uh, soybean exports in the world. The United States has been the second largest exporter, followed by Argentina and Paraguay. Now, that's the only four countries that really matter globally in terms of soybean production, at least for export. I don't know what China grows, but China is a net importer of soybeans and has been. And they've been getting the bulk of their soybeans from the, the biggest exporter being uh, Brazil, and it turns out they probably overbought from Brazil, and uh, Brazil also has a growing domestic demand for it. Uh, they just oversold, and now suddenly they're on the world market trying to buy soybeans. Yeah, the world's big, biggest producer of soybeans is trying to buy soybeans. Is that not funny? And the way it is, but it's, oh, that's great for the United States. Well, not directly because their laws say they can't buy GMO soybeans, which is what we grow here. They change the laws they might so they're basically competing for soybeans from argentina and paraguay for the most part but to see china uh has been buying record uh, amounts of soybeans already that's part of what problem brazil ran into and uh record sales in the united states so what's happening is that uh the soybeans uh, 
uh, are, are going to be going up in price, and they already are very significantly, uh, because China's got to compete now with their main supplier for extra sales, and China's in a bit of a hurt, as you might know. So they're buying uh, uh, soybeans from the United States. They got to compete to buy them from Paraguay and Uruguay. So globally, the total market for soybeans, the prices are going to go up. They've already gone up since <clears throat> August. Uh, the price that the farmers are getting for soybeans, or at least what they're selling them for in the United States, it may be a commodity thing as much as anything, is like 20% higher. Since August, the price of soybeans has gone up 20%. And I can expect that to go up a fair bit more. And that's going to impact food prices uh, directly and indirectly. Now, soybeans are mostly used for their meal and their oil. Uh, and it's mostly used for animal feed. It's also, there, you know, but so is corn and a lot of other things. They're also used a lot in, uh, you know, of course you get your to to tofu and soy sauce and, you know, a lot, a lot of things like that that we do consume and have soybeans in them. And some of our products that we use oils from use soy oil, soy milk, soy flour, soy milk. Uh, you know, that's soyant. <laughs> yeah, there is actually now a soyant green, soyant pink, soyant white. Yeah, creepy, right? <laughs> At least it's hopefully made from soybeans instead of uh, <laughs> like a certain movie that you may know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so what's happened is that the whole world market is going to be shaken up on the soybean production side. And other things. So the reason, once, he, once again, China has had a horrible year agriculturally. Uh, the Yangtze River Valley has been flooded almost the entire growing season, and for much much of the Yellow River Valley too. And the Yangtze River Valley produces 40% of the agricultural output of China. I don't mean ever farm in China, and even in the Yangtze or, or Yellow River Valley have been flooded. But a whole lot of them have been because of prime. Uh, farming land is usually on the river bottom lands where the rivers had traditionally been depositing silts and things that was enriching the lands over the winters and then they would grow the rest of the year. Uh, at least that's how it always worked around here. But now they've dammed up each other's dams so they're not having that soil enrichment benefit. But that's where modern agriculture comes in and throws in all the chemicals. <laughs> well, they're in a hurt. They're in a pickle there in China. And so, and, you know, the population is still growing, so their demand would naturally go up. But this year is really ratcheted up. They are buying a lot. It's projected that China is going to want to buy, by USDA, that China will want to buy 100 million metric tons of soybeans. 100 million metric tons. So, yeah, the price is going up. When, when uh, the main supplier is out on the market trying to buy them and they're competing with their main customer, yeah. That's a, that's a recipe for prices going up. And here's the other thing to bring in. The uh, reserves, you know, they always have grain in reserve typically. And, and that gets you through tough times. It you know, gives you uh, margin for catastrophes and things like that. Well, the world reserves of soybeans has been dwindling for three years in a row now. With the Grand Southern Minimum, we might expect that to continue. But the funny thing is, this has actually been a good year for soybean production, even though uh, it's actually a record year, even though we've cut production in this area. Now, the price is going back up. That might make farmers here want to turn, return to growing winter wheat and soybeans. It's funny, though, even the, the soy fields I saw this year, there weren't many. I didn't see any wheat planted early on this year. Wheat was not always something that was grown in the great abundance here in the south, and I was kind of impressed when they did start growing the winter wheat along with the soybeans, but uh, that's kind of, that went away this year. I think they might have got burnt last year or two with a crop. It just didn't work out for them as well. This is a little bit south for a wheat growing territory, but they did. They, we grew winter wheat quite a bit for a few years in, in with the soybeans. So that may return. I don't know. Uh, some uh, channels have been reporting damage to winter wheat harvest, you know, like right now. And well, my friend Stacy Savicki busted that because winter wheat's not up for harvest right now. <laughs> It's not even ready to be planted. <laughs> well, yeah, they'll start planting it now, actually, in this area. They've probably already planted it up north of Wisconsin. Uh, yeah, they harvest the beans, usually, and then they plant the wheat, and bean harvest is just taking place. Uh, they've just harvested what few beans I do see around here. Uh, this field had been one of those that alternated between beans and corn every year, and they just turned it all to cotton. You can see lots of cotton out through here. And so the farmers in the United States, the, the ones that are growing stuff, stand to be doing pretty well for now. 
Uh, I have done videos to question the uh, uh, sustainability of monoculture agriculture, and I think that's still an open question, especially in face of the grand solar minimum that will be coming up on this in the next several years. But some areas are going to do pretty well. The temperature in my region here is pretty stable, and I think uh, the farmers here will do better than in many other areas. We do know we've had some problems with grain and corn with the drench coat that hit the Midwest, but that doesn't seem to be a major catastrophe in the, the overall market scheme. Maybe combined with what's going on in China, we may see pressures in other grain markets similar to what we're seeing in soybeans. That's, uh, there's still a lot to be told on that, but it's going to be... Uh, it's a combination of factors. You know, it's like when you have big problems, uh, things aren't really catastrophic unless all the whole, you say, like, you know, you have these protective layers. Sometimes you call them Swiss cheese because your protective layers have holes in them. And it's usually not until uh, all the holes and various protective layers line up that you see straight through to, to a problem occurrence. That's a, uh, that's a phrase you may hear me say sometimes, all the holes in the Swiss cheese line up. That's the way we look at risk in the world of rockets. Uh, you have a lot of things that's risky all the time, but you have redundancy and other things that's supposed to protect you. But sometimes all the holes in that Swiss cheese lines up and the rocket goes boom. <laughs> and uh, so but this is not a rocket talk. We'll talk more about that on my Green Greg, uh, Galactic Greg's channel. <laughs> so... Another thing, pan, uh, the grocery stores have been stocking up or trying to get ready for the next curve, a uh, second wave to come in this uh, winter. And it's talking about there may be more shutdowns. Uh, look, I'm not the guy directing the policy for that or anything like that. All I'm reporting here may be the results of these kind of things, what may happen. Runs on the grocery stores and things like that. Well, they've been trying to stock up on but some things are some things they may be doing well in the areas that they're hurting in is like soups. It turns out that uh, Campbell soups and uh, General Mills are way behind in their uh, soup preparations, having enough soup. It turns out I guess soup is highly in demand in times like this because it's something for all these people who've been eating out and can't go to restaurants and aren't uh, appreciably good at cooking or just don't have time uh, have been buying in higher quantities. So soup sales have soared. <laughs> soup sales soar. There's a head of a line. <laughs> soup sales soar. <laughs> a pocketbook soar. <laughs> Eat a bowl, go to bed and snore. All right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, they're having troubles with that. They're having troubles with a lot of snack items have been completely discontinued. And then you got the aluminum can shortage, which isn't entirely over. It hit some drinks and some canned goods. The biggest problem they're having in meat packing plants in these areas are uh, when they get a, people working in close proximity and they have a sickness, uh, they wind up shutting down production lines. It puts things behind. Uh, you know, there's some stuff I still don't find on the grocery shelves yet. You know, there's some things like, you know, 90% uh, rubbing alcohol. Find that on a grocery store shelf anymore. Find there's 70% starting to come back, but for how long? A um, good thing that I had bought and always did buy and have ample supplies around. Just the way I operate, it's the way I roll. I've always prepped, and I had plenty because that's one of the things I always use in my farm operation and for other things. So I had plenty of it. But it was now getting mighty thin. But fortunately, the 70% at least is coming back. So. Uh, Here's the word. You better get things while the getting's good. Uh, we may be in the eye of the storm here, but the next eye wall may be upon us. Uh, I'm hearing numbers of reported cases going up. Now, whether or not you want to buy off on any of that's immaterial to the point of this discussion. The point of this discussion is your preparations. And your preparation says, hey, things may come to pass where you aren't going to find stuff on the store shelves. No matter what you believe about a bug going around, pro, con, whatever. We saw it happen once. We may say it again. I don't think shutdowns will be quite like they were, but I do expect impacts. I do expect things are going to happen. So you got to be ready for it. There's also uh, other economic pressures that are pushing on us. And there's the fact that um, we have a lot of political pressure in this country right now. You got to get ready for it. I, I'm not as skeptical about that as some people because I think a lot of what happened in the last few months has backfired on some of the people that were pushing it. It didn't give them quite uh, what they were looking for and has cost them politically. Uh, you know, you don't go around, you know, the statistics have shown 
the protests are more, far more successful when they're peaceful. And I know the people have been involved in these protests. I've had people on my Facebook site basically yelling at me, telling me how peaceful they are. <laughs> and how pe oh, Greg, I was at the event. It was totally peaceful. Nothing happened. But I'd see pictures from the events that didn't look all that peaceful to me. But, hey, <laughs> I did go to one. I actually went to one. I did a video on it, did a live stream, and did a follow-up video. And, yeah, that one was peaceful. <laughs> There's just a bunch of kids running around repeating the same chants over and over and over and over. It's like, come on, guys, you got to get some better cadence than that. You know, gee whiz. You know, it's kind of mind numb and say the same thing over and over and over and over and over. Oh, they had about two chants is all they had. At least that's all I heard. <laughs> so, yeah, I went to a protest, you know. You might have seen me walk around the courthouse square asking the guy, hey, where's the riots? <laughs> I had a little fun with it, you know. Uh, you got to have a sense of humor in life. That's one of the main things. You got to stay balanced with all these things coming at you. Never panic. There's a car on there. I think I'm having a problem. I'm good. Thank you. Lady, you see me pulling over here. <laughs> That's sweet over. Just doing a video. Hey, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple wild edibles before we go here. <laughs> As you know, I might be uh, off to do that. I wouldn't want to eat them next to a cotton field, between a cotton field and a road. Well, my friends, we find wild edibles wherever we're at. And I do a lot on that, and the reason is because when it gets when it gets really tough, you got to survive. And I've been trying to help you guys with that. All those videos. Are the, not the most popular ones I ever do. So, let me show you. Well, she actually turned around and came down this way to talk to me. She was going the other direction. Ain't that great? How about that? See, there's a corner up here. And that lady came around. That lady down there. She came around. She was going to go that way. She, but she drove down here and turned around. Just because she saw my car here. She went out of the way. See, there's good-hearted people in this world. There are good-hearted people everywhere on the planet. I keep telling you guys that. So that was sweet. That was really sweet. And a woman, a young woman offering help an old man out here by Phil. <laughs> but that was nice. All right. So gives you heart and hope for the world. We do have heart. We do have hope. I'm not all gloom and doom. I got a whole channel that talks about space. It's called Galactic Gregs. I got a lot of hope for the future. We just got to get through these tough times we're in now. If we can survive and not wipe ourselves out, our future could be beyond your imagination spectacular. But we got to get through these crazy times, get the craziness out of our head, and figure out how to get along with each other. <laughs> and I did a couple of videos talking about that topic, specifically where I talked about uh, a nuke in every pot, and I talked about uh, talking about the, the proliferation of technology of mass destruction, and not talking just nukes. And I talked about uh, one where I used the number two pencil, and you know basically it's talking about the sustainable the fragility, the fragility of our civilization, just how fragile our civilization is is mind boggling. Anyway, let's look at this. Two wild edibles right here at my feet in a medicinal. That is narrow leaf plantain, my friends. Narrow leaf plantain. And that is really good for bug bites, snake bites, spider bites. And is a wild edible. But, but hey, don't take my advice. I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you what people use it for, okay? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not even a master herbalist. So check with your local experts before you use any plant for anything. And, of course, check with your doctor before you use it medicinally. Yeah, I'll have to go and tell you. That's okay, right? <laughs> oh, here's the pills. Take the pills. But, you know, I have to tell you that because we have such a uh, country that loves the freedom of speech so much that the AMA would chain me to a wall and have a diesel truck run through it probably or something like that. <laughs> that, my friends, is wood sorrel which I always call belly goat grass. It too is edible. <laughs> so I can't go anywhere in this region of the country without finding something I can know to eat any time of the year. We have greens that grow down here in the wintertime even. So there's always something that you can eat. Getting carbs may be the big challenge. We'll cover that in a future video. But it's amazing what you can find. It, this is the end of October. Uh, we're, we're about to go into season where I'm, I'm seeing it start to come up now. Uh, and I've just tore it out of my garden pretty good, but uh, chickweed, chickweed is, is a green that grows very abundantly here in the wintertime. 
uh, and then you get purple dead and nettle. I've done those uh, in previous videos. Friends, if you don't see my videos, go to the top of the left corner of my screen and click videos and scroll down as far as YouTube will let you go. You used to view every video on the channel that way, but they seem to be limiting that now. So you can also go to my playlist and check that. Although I didn't enter all my videos in the playlist, but you'll see more of them that way. Or you can also go up there to the top left and click videos and sort from the oldest. At least you'll get the oldest and newest. You might miss a few in the middle. <laughs> As you'll probably see about 150 either way. I got about 400 on the channel. So there's about a gap of 100. You won't see that way. Most of those will be in the playlist. My friends, if you're not subscribed to my channel, subscribe, bang the update notification bell. That way you can get the information you need to survive, thrive, and stay out of the hive. Uh, the things you, uh, that I report will help you keep your eyes wide open and head on the swivel. So it's going to be an adventurous ride here in the next few years. I don't know what's going to happen with food supplies. We get through this grand solar minimum. But it historically has been a very, very rough time. Historically, it leads to lots of rain and flooding in some areas, like China. No dynasty in China has survived a grand solar minimum. But they got a lot of people there that are hungry. Uh, if they, they keep uh, on a food shortage like they've had this year, uh, how well, how long will the world be able to keep up and feed them? How long, how long will we all be able to produce too? You see, these are good questions. Uh, I do expect food prices to go up and shortages to increase. Uh, like I said, this year's not, this year's actually been a pretty good year for farmers, all things considered. Better than I anticipated. Uh, and we are uh, in the, the, you know, we have the 11 year cycle in a, in a solar cycle. So we're, we're coming back up uh, out of the, uh, the, the local minimum into a, a local maximum. These maxima are getting lower and lower. That's what happens on grand solar minimum, is you have several cycles that are just flat and flattened out. So our maximum may be a lot lower this time, but at least it's not a minimum. What's gonna happen on the next minimums? Well, we'll see. We may have a few good years here. We may have a few good years here, but we gotta keep ourselves vigilant because we know they got certain agenda out there, like two zero, three zero. So let's stay vigilant. Join the Freedom Restoration Foundation. We've got a page on Facebook. We're working on a few others. So, uh, and email me at halfhighspace at aol.com. Thank you for watching.